saints, peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. I hope everyone is having a fantastic day today. Today we finish up our study. We're at the end of Paul's letter to the Galatian body of Christ. And in this study, we're going to be talking about many different parts of Paul's letter. We're going to be bouncing back and forth, bringing the rest of the puzzle pieces together, if you will. Firstly, if you're new to this ministry and you haven't taken part in the complete study on the book of Acts, I highly encourage you do so before you watch anything else. The book of Acts lays out the foundation of the body of Christ, how it was created, why it was created, who we are today in Christ Jesus, and where we're going in the future. Now, the book of Galatians happens to be one of Paul's earliest books. In my opinion, based on various key details, uh, is that Galatians was the first book that Paul wrote just before writing Thessalonians. And Paul's journey throughout the Galatian region can be seen in the book of Acts, chapters 13 through chapter 16. Then from Acts 16 on, Paul would he head west and would write his remaining books over the next several years, which can also be found in the book of Acts. In fact, Paul's 30 plus year ministry can be found from Acts 13 through Acts 28. Then Paul would be martyred right around 66 AD, shortly before the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD. Now, to recap on our last study on Galatians chapter 5, first we saw how Paul spoke about the liberty the Galatians should have been enjoying in Christ Jesus. And part of that liberty was freedom from the bondage of being under the law. Second, Paul discusses how love fulfills the law. Third, Paul tells believers to walk and live in the Spirit. And for those of you who wanted to learn more about walking and living in the Spirit, which is extremely important to understand, the link, once again, is on the screen in case you missed it in the last study. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul tells Timothy to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And what is the word of truth? It is God's word, all 66 books of the King James Version Bible. Now, one method that I like to use to write, rightly divide God's word is to ensure, uh, first of all, that I ask the questions, who, what, where, when, how, and why, whenever I'm studying God's word. And as we ask those questions in relation to Paul's letter to the Galatians, it's apparent that Paul has been speaking a lot about Jewish history, their origin, going back all the way to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so on, and we most certainly know that Paul is addressing the body of Christ throughout the Galatian region. But, but when we rightly divide, we notice something. That the specific language, analogies, and history that Paul uses in his letter is clearly addressing his kinsmen, the Jewish believers in Galatia. Recall from the third chapter of, of Galatians, Paul asks, who bewitched them back under the yoke of bondage, Jewish laws and traditions. And in order to be manipulated or bewitched back under the laws, once again, they would have had to be under the law in the first place, right? A, this is a clue to whom Paul is addressing. Now, Paul's overwhelming love for his Jewish brethren can be seen all throughout many of Paul's letters. One in particular is in the book of Romans. In fact, in reading Romans chapter 9, 10, 11, you'll discover by right division that Paul was addressing Israel. Just like in our study in Galatians. In Romans 9 verse 1, Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. 
And in case it's not clear enough to the reader, Paul makes it very clear who he's addressing in the next verse, in verse 4. Who are Israelites, the Jews, right? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. So clearly, Paul loved Israel, the seed of Jacob, his kinsmen, his Jewish brethren. After all, Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. Also, if, if you remember from our study on the book of Acts, the Jewish religious system was divided into two groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. One distinct difference between those two was that the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. But the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, nor in angels, nor in spirits, regardless of some major differences between the Pharisees and Sadducees. They were both very zealous about the Mosaic system of law, the commandments, good works, traditions, temple worship, animal sacrifices, oblations, and so on. So Paul, a Pharisee, a Hebrew Hebrews, was very, very zealous. It's this zeal for the law and for Israel as a nation that initially drove Paul to attack the little flock. The little flock were the group of Jewish believers, remember, in Jesus' earthly ministry. And this little flock, in Paul's mind, was a threat to the nation of Israel, was a threat to the Sanhedrin, was a threat to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, was a threat to all the traditions and laws. And this drove Paul to seek out the little flock, have them arrested and even killed. However, God had other plans for Paul. Paul becomes a believer in Christ Jesus and on Christ Jesus. And now the situation is reversed for Paul. Paul's new threat becomes the very religious system that he grew up in his entire life. What he was fighting for at first, now he's fighting against. Now he sees the law as the enemy and grace as his ally, his friend. Paul's letter to the Galatians was to address this enemy system of laws that was attacking the body of Christ who were all under grace. And we saw in our last study, Paul addressing the Jewish believers, telling them to persist in their grace and refuse the religious system based on laws and works and traditions. In Galatians 5 verse 1, Paul says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The work again here points to those people who were once under the law, the Jews. They were being tricked out of their liberty, tricked back into being servants, back to keeping the commandments and the laws and so forth back to worshiping on certain days, back to uh, under bondage, back to their Judaic traditions. Again, these are all terms familiar to the Jewish brethren, Paul's kinsmen. To Paul's disappointment, unfortunately, there were some believing Jews going back under the law. Paul addresses them in Galatians 1, in verse 6, we saw, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul warns them concerning believing another gospel, any other gospel than the one Paul taught them. In Galatians verse 8, Paul addresses a very stern warning here. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, 
let him be accursed. A very serious warning. In our study on those verses, in particular, back in Galatians 1, we saw how these verses draw a distinction between Gospels. They point to uh, different dispensations or administrations, okay? And how do we know that? Well, if you notice, for example, how James, John, Peter, and even the angels in Revelation all preach a gospel that's very different from the one Paul teaches throughout his 13 books. They're preaching another gospel. And according to Paul, all these people and angels are accursed. However, we know they can't be accursed. And there has to be some logical answer for the distinct and clear differences between Paul's gospel and these other gospels, right? Well, understanding right division and dispensations explains why there's an apparent contradiction between what Paul says and what the kingdom saints say, or the little flock. Peter, James, John, Luke are all part of that little flock that we talked about. The answer to why there seems to be a difference lies within right division itself. Paul is addressing people inside the dispensation we're in today. Okay, in the book of Galatians, the, the, the body of Christ, the, the mystery, the dispensation of grace, the mystery of the body of Christ. So when the rapture takes place, the body of Christ, we will be removed. The dispensation of the grace of God comes to a close at the rapture. Then a different gospel will be preached. And we know it's going to be the kingdom gospel once again. The kingdom gospel that you see Peter preaching in the beginning of the book of Acts. In the four gospels, Jesus is preaching the kingdom gospel. Hebrews through Revelation is all about the kingdom gospel once again. A faith plus works based system. They'll have to endure till the end to be delivered. Also, the angels in Revelation will be preaching a different gospel than Paul's because Paul's gospel no longer applies at that point. Paul's gospel, the gospel of grace, the mystery, will come to an end with the mystery of the harpazo, the rapture. Then we see the kingdom program start up once again, the same gospel that Peter, John, and James were preaching that was paused at the stoning of Stephen when Israel rejected the Holy Spirit. At the start of Daniel's 70th week, God is once again going to focus on Israel's covenants and promises. After the rapture, God will once again continue to gather the lost sheep of the house of Israel. God needs to fulfill that covenant. When Jesus came, he said he came to gather the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? Well, did Jesus finish gathering all the lost sheep or not? Well, no, he was cut off early. The final gathering of the rest of the lost sheep of the house of Israel will take place during Daniel's 70th week after the rapture. God is not finished with Israel at this point in our time. Now, in our final study on Galatians chapter 6, Paul's letter is going to address first the fulfilling of the law of Christ. Second, he's going to say God is not mocked. We will reap what we sow. Third, sowing to the flesh versus sowing to the spirit. Fourth, good works as it applies to the body of Christ Jesus. Now, in Galatians 6, of course, in the King James Version Bible alone, in verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. We see Paul address the law of Christ back in Galatians 5, if you remember, 5.14, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Continuing on, Galatians 6 verse 3, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, 
God is not mocked for whosoever a man for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap now in a couple of years Paul will write a letter to the Corinthians concerning how we the body of Christ will reap one day in the future also addressed is the fact that our liberty or grace is the most it is most definitely not a license to continue willfully sinning second corinthians 5 verse 10 for we must all all of us all of us we must all appear this is speaking about the body of christ here we must all appear before the judgment seat of christ that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad okay Galatians 6 verse 8 for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption for he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting and let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not Paul would again address the differences between sowing in the flesh versus sowing in the spirit and the results of each type of those in the book of Corinthians 1 Corinthians 3 10 according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ now if any man build upon this foundation gold silver precious stones wood hay stubble every man's work shall be made manifest for the day okay look at that the day here what day is this what is Paul speaking about for the day shall declare it the day is the judgment seat of Christ okay for the day shall declare it because it that day the judgment seat of Christ shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon he shall receive a reward if any man's work shall be burnt he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire the things you sow spiritually in Christ Jesus for example planting seeds that result in salvation of souls edifying the saints our brothers and sisters and teaching you know that results in spiritual growth okay those things spiritual will survive the testing by fire however sowing in material things sowing in traditions of religion uh, keeping the laws counting on your own performance for justification all those things that seem to be good but don't result in salvation of souls will be destroyed when tested by fire all of these things whether they survive testing or not will determine the reward that we get on the day the judgment seat of Christ continuing on Galatians 6 10 as we have therefore opportunity let us do good unto all men especially unto them who are of the household of faith Paul also mentions some of the good works were able to perform through the power of the Holy Spirit in the book of Romans Romans 12 verse 4 for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office so we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministry let us wait on our ministering or he that teacheth on teaching or he that exhorteth on ex exhortation he that giveth let him do it with simplicity he that ruleth with diligence he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness continuing on verse 11 ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ Paul writes that there were people who were acting Jewish to hide the fact 
that they were believers in Christ Jesus to avoid persecution even going so far as, as to get circumcised pretending to follow the Jewish laws to hide their belief in our Lord they, they did all these outward things to keep from being persecuted uh, to hide their belief but in doing these outward things they were also placing themselves back under bondage the bondage of the law making the cross of none effect verse 13 for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature Galatians 3 28 says there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither bond nor free there is neither male nor female for ye are all one in Christ Jesus now one problem taking place in Galatia was that certain Jewish believers were once again trying to make themselves distinct as a group right it's trying to still they were trying to separate the Gentiles and the Jews and this distinction was creating division within the body of Christ Galatians 6 16 and as many as walk according to this rule peace be on them and mercy upon Israel of God from henceforth let no man trouble me for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus brethren the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit amen now on the screen we see a general overview of the subjects Paul covered in this letter to the body of Christ in Galatia and now to summarize Paul's early ministry Paul is on his way to Damascus to arrest the little flock and have them brought back to Jerusalem for punishment you remember that in Acts 9 right Jesus confronts Paul on the way to Damascus and Paul becomes a believer Paul eventually arrives in Damascus Ananias is told to speak to Paul heal his eyesight tells Paul what our Lord Jesus revealed to him that Paul would be sent to the Gentiles Paul leaves Damascus he heads down to Arabia then he returns to Damascus and soon after Paul heads to Jerusalem he speaks to Peter then Paul faces persecution from the zealous law-minded Jews and escapes to his birthplace a Roman Gentile city named Tarsus approximately 10 years later Barnabas is sent to Tarsus to retrieve Paul they head down to Antioch then they're given the task of bringing supplies to Jerusalem and from Jerusalem Paul heads back north back to Antioch and it's here in Antioch where Paul's journeys would begin somewhere around 47 to 48 AD about 14 years after his conversion on the road to Damascus now in Acts chapter 13 through 16 Luke records Paul's first journeys across to Cyprus north to Pamphylia then into the Galatian region and if you remember Paul wasn't well received in those areas the Galatians tried to kill Paul by stoning him even supposing that Paul had been dead but he didn't die God still had much more for Paul to do and shortly after Paul's journey through the Galatian region Paul went back to Jerusalem for what we know as the Jerusalem Council somewhere around 49 AD the foundation for the Jerusalem Council was to form an agreement between the Jews and the Gentiles that the Gentile believers would no longer be pressured to adhere to the Jewish laws or traditions only that the Gentiles would abstain from fornication and the blood of strangled animals and so on then around 50 AD Paul would return to the Galatian region to pick up Timothy then they head west towards Trous then Paul would receive a vision about a man calling him to come to Macedonia after traveling through Trous Macedonia Philippi Thessal Thessalonica and Corinth and so on Paul would return to the Galatian region again approximately in 53 AD now jumping to 57 AD Paul gets arrested in Jerusalem 60 AD Paul arrives in Rome to stand in front of Caesar the Roman Emperor to be tried 62 AD he's released from prison from probation and parole and so from 62 to 66 AD Paul would continue in his ministry and then Paul of course would be martyred in 66 AD after a 30 plus year ministry
So we see how the physician Luke records much of Paul's ministry and travels throughout the book of Acts. And in 70 AD, the temple is destroyed by the Romans. And if you're interested in seeing the timeline of Paul's ministry, I'll put the link on the screen here so to help further your studies in God's word. And this, of course, concludes uh, our very brief introduction and study on Paul's letter to the Galatians. Peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you saints. Thank you for your prayers and your support. And Lord willing, I'll see you on the next study, whatever and whenever that will be. Ooh.